Welcome to the sixth day of Craftlet, our 12-day Christmas story extravaganza. Today, on our sixth day, I bring you children's stories. Lots and lots of children's stories. And there's not a whole lot to say about them except they're children's stories. And they almost entirely focus on Santa or Christmas trees and things like that, or goblins. And that surprised me a little bit, because I think of goblins as going along with Halloween. These are not those goblins. Think of them more like Christmas elves or Christmas gnomes. That's the world they seem to inhabit. They seem pretty consistently to be mischievous, but they also seem to want to be loved. Along with the whimsical stories, I have one fun, true story for you in the middle of the episode. And that's pretty much it. I'm just going to play the stories back to back for you and come back at you with more audio tomorrow on the seventh day. All right, here we go with the beginning of our children's stories for Christmas. The Goblin's Christmas by Elizabeth Anderson Preface Once upon a time I visited Fairyland and spent a day in Goblin Town. The people there are much like ourselves, only they are very, very small and roguish. They play pranks on one another and have great fun. They are good-natured and jolly and rarely get angry. But if one does get angry, he quickly recovers his good nature and joins again in the sport. If a goblin should continue angry, he would take on some visible form. Perhaps he would become a toad or a squirrel or some other little animal and would have to live here on the earth plane forevermore. But if he keeps good-natured, he can come here and have his fun, and not be seen by anyone except a seer or very wise person. The goblins are gracious to the wise people now, but they were not always so. A long, long time ago, on a Christmas Eve, the fairy folk were having great sport. All the little people of the unseen world had gathered together in the earth realm, There were brownies and gnomes and elves. Even some little cherubs had joined them. They were having a wild dance and a gay time, when who should appear but Kris Kringle. Now the fairies did not know that he was a magician or seer, and so they tried to make sport of him. But Kris, by his wonderful magic, changed them into the most beautiful toys. They became straight little jumping jacks, and dolls in bright dresses, and the dearest little rabbit with white soft fur. And somewhere in the bottom of the sleigh, one was turned into a cute little teddy bear. Then old Chris tucked all these toys into his roomy sleigh, and shook the reins of his waiting steed. Go on, he said, for I've many, many a chimney to reach to-night. Now this is the tale of the goblin's Christmas, that the moonbeams told, as they heard it from the Fairy Queen, who declares that every word of it is perfectly true. To Earl and Georgia The little man and tiny maid, who love the fairies in the glade, who see them in the tangled grass, the gnomes and brownies as they pass, who hear the sprites from Elfland call, go frolic with these brownies small, and join these merry sporting elves, but ever be your own sweet selves. THE GOBLIN'S CHRISTMAS The big bright moon hung high and round in a densely darkened sky. The tall pines swayed and mocked and groaned, the mountains grew so high. That the man in the moon came out and said, Ho, spooks for a merry dance! The winds blow hard, the caverns roar, while o'er the earth they prance. A witch and a goblin led the sprites, out from the sky they sprung. And down the milky way they slid, and over a chasm swung. The streams around ran witches' broth, the fumes were strong and rank. These elfin creatures all were wroth, while of the stuff they drank. The cunning moon looked on and laughed, with a shrill and sneering jibe. Her soul grew fat to see them chaffed, this mad and elfish tribe. The big black cauldron boiled so high, with food for these queer mites, that it lit the world throughout the sky, and down came all the sprites. Their mad career upset a star, as through the air they flew. 
It cringed in fear and shot afar, and fell where no one knew. Orion's sword was broke in bits, Corona's crown was gone, Capella seemed to lose her wits, while all so longed for dawn. Then from the night there came a sound, of sleigh bells ringing sweet. Out of the chaos came a man, Chris Kringle for his Christmas treat. Ho, oh, Chris, they cried, we'll have some fun, we'll bind the old man down, we'll tie him up and toss him o'er into our goblin town. They climbed the slade with shout and din to bind his hands and feet. A hundred strong they clamoured in, our good old Chris to meet. He sat quite still with twinkling eyes, then seized his mystic wand. He raised it up and waved it round. Stilled was this chattering band. Stiffly stark and still they stood, clad in elfish clothes. Some were wax and some were wood. One had crushed his nose. Playthings rare, he said and smiled, for children rich and poor. Some I'll leave the crippled child, and some at the orphan's door. He shook his reins and called his steed to bear him swiftly on, for well it knew its master's need to hurry ere the dawn. From house to house they scampered down, their sleigh bells ringing clear, through chimneys in the sleepy town, good Chris and his reindeer. The windows rattled, the moonbeams tattled, a tale so strange and queer. They told how at night, in the dire fright, the moon had hid in fear. That he'd called in sport his elfish court of spooks and witches gay. Each elfin child, by glee beguiled, brought scores of others, they say. Then a man appeared with flowing beard in a sled with a reindeer fleet. They gathered about with din and shout to bind him hands and feet. Then the moon laughed loud at the gathering crowd while he held his sides in mirth to see old Chris in a plight like this toiling o'er the earth. But alas for the moon, he had laughed like a loon, for Chris is a hero of old. Yes, Chris is a seer, with his small reindeer he captured the goblins bold. And he changed them, they say, in a wonderful way, to toys for his Christmas cheer. The big dolls stare with a goblin air, the small ones cringe with fear. While the moonbeams prattle, I hear a rattle of hooves on the chimney side. Then out of the snow I gaze below. Hurrah! It's Kris Kringle! I cried. Then sly as a mouse he entered the house and hung up his treasures so gay. Then out with a dash he sped like a flash into the night and away. The Legend of the Christmas Tree by Lucy Wheelock Two little children were sitting by the fire one cold winter's night. All at once they heard a timid knock at the door, and one ran to open it. There, outside, in the cold and the darkness, stood a child with no shoes upon his feet, and clad in thin, ragged garments. He was shivering with cold, and he asked to come in and warm himself. "'Yes, come!' cried both the children. "'You shall have our place by the fire. Come in!' They drew the little stranger to their warm seat and shared their supper with him, and gave him their bed while they slept on a hard bench. In the night they were awakened by strains of sweet music, and looking out, they saw a band of children in shining garments approaching the house. They were playing on golden harps, and the air was full of melody. Suddenly, the stranger child stood before them, no longer cold and ragged, but clad in silvery light. His soft voice said, I was cold, and you took me in. I was hungry, and you fed me. I was tired, and you gave me your bed. I am the Christ child, wandering through the world to bring peace and happiness to all good children. As you have given to me, so may this tree every year give rich fruit to you. So saying, he broke a branch from the fir tree that grew near the door, and he planted it in the ground and disappeared. But the branch grew into a great tree, and every year it bore wonderful golden fruit for the kind children. Story 24 of the Children's Book of Christmas Stories Little Gretchen and the Wooden Shoe by Elizabeth Harrison. The following story is one of many 
which has drifted down to us from the story-loving nurseries and hearthstones of Germany. I cannot recall when I first had it told to me as a child, varied, of course, by different tellers, but always leaving that sweet, tender inspiration of God's loving care for the least of his children. I have since read different versions of it in at least a half-dozen storybooks for children. Once upon a time, a long time ago, far away across the great ocean, in a country called Germany, there could be seen a small log hut on the edge of a great forest, whose fir trees extended for miles and miles to the north. This little house, made of heavy-hewn logs, had but one room in it. A rough pine door gave entrance to this room, and a small square window admitted the light. At the back of the house was built an old-fashioned stone chimney, out of which in winter usually curled a thin, blue smoke, showing that there was not very much fire within. Small as the house was, it was large enough for the two people who lived in it. I want to tell you a story today about these two people. One was an old gray-haired woman, so old that the little children of the village, nearly half a mile away, often wondered whether she had come into the world with the huge mountains and the great fir trees, which stood like giants back of her small hut. Her face was wrinkled all over with deep lines, which, if the children could only have read aright, would have told them of many years of cheerful, happy self-sacrifice, of loving, anxious watching beside sick beds, of quiet endurance of pain, of many a day of hunger and cold, and of a thousand deeds of unselfish love for other people. But, of course, they could not read this strange handwriting. They only knew that she was old and wrinkled, and that she stooped as she walked. None of them seemed to fear her, for her smile was always cheerful, and she had a kindly word for each of them if they chanced to meet her on her way to and from the village. With this old, old woman lived a very little girl. So bright and happy was she that the travelers who passed by the lonesome little house on the edge of the forest often thought of a sunbeam as they saw her. These two people were known in the village as Granny Goodyear and Little Gretchen. The winter had come, and the frost had snapped off many of the smaller branches from the pine trees in the forest. Gretchen and her granny were up by daybreak each morning. After their simple breakfast of oatmeal, Gretchen would run to the little closet and fetch Granny's old woolen shawl, which seemed almost as old as Granny herself. Gretchen always claimed the right to put the shawl over her granny's head, even though she had to climb onto the wooden bench to do it. After carefully pinning it under Granny's chin, she gave her a good-bye kiss, and Granny started out for her morning's work in the forest. This work was nothing more, nor less, than the gathering up of the twigs and branches which the autumn winds and winter frosts had thrown upon the ground. These were carefully gathered into a large bundle, which Granny tied together with a strong linen band. She then managed to lift the bundle to her shoulder and trudged off to the village with it. Here she sold the faggots for kindling wood to the people of the village. Sometimes she would only get a few pence each day, and sometimes a dozen or more, but on this money little Gretchen and she managed to live. They had their home, and the forest kindling furnished the wood for the fire which kept them warm in cold weather. In the summertime Granny had a little garden at the back of the hut, where she raised, with little Gretchen's help, a few potatoes and turnips and onions. These she carefully stored away for winter use. To this meager supply, the pennies gained by selling the twigs from the forest, added the oatmeal for Gretchen, and a little black coffee for Granny. Meat was a thing they never thought of having. It cost too much money. Still, Granny and Gretchen were very happy, because they love each other dearly. Sometimes Gretchen would be left alone all day long in the hut, because Granny would have some work to do in the village after selling her bundle of sticks and twigs. It was during these long days that little Gretchen had taught herself to sing the song which the wind sang to the pine branches. In the summer time, she learned the chirp and twitter of the birds, until her voice might almost be mistaken for a bird's voice. She learned to dance as the swaying shadows did, and even to talk to the stars which shone through the little square window when Granny came home too late or too tired to talk. Sometimes, when the weather was fine, or her Granny had an extra bundle of newly knitted stockings to take to the village, she would let little Gretchen go along with her. It chanced that one of these trips to the town came just the week before Christmas, 
and Gretchen's eyes were delighted by the sight of the lovely Christmas trees which stood in the windows of the village store. It seemed to her that she would never tire of looking at the knit dolls, the woolly lambs, the little wooden shops with their queer painted men and women in them, and all the other fine things. She had never owned a plaything in her whole life. Therefore, toys which you and I would not think much of seemed to her to be very beautiful. That night, after their supper of baked potatoes was over, and little Gretchen had cleared away the dishes and swept up the hearth, because Granny Dear was so tired. She brought her own small wooden stool and placed it very near Granny's feet and sat down upon it, folding her hands on her lap. Granny knew that this meant she wanted to talk about something, so she smilingly laid away the large Bible which she had been reading and took up her knitting, which is as much as to say, Well, Gretchen, dear, Granny is ready to listen. Granny, said Gretchen slowly, It's almost Christmas time, isn't it? Yes, dearie, said Granny, only five more days now, and then she sighed. But little Gretchen was so happy that she did not notice Granny's sigh. What do you think, Granny? I'll get this Christmas, said she, looking up eagerly into Granny's face. Ah, child, child, said Granny, shaking her head. You'll have no Christmas this year. We're too poor for that. Oh, but Granny interrupted little Gretchen. Think of all the beautiful toys we saw in the village today. Surely Santa Claus has sent enough for every little child. Ah, dearie, said Granny. Those toys are for people who can pay money for them, and we have no money to spend for Christmas toys. Well, Granny, said Gretchen, perhaps some of the little children who live in the great house on the hill at the other end of the village will be willing to share some of their toys with me. They will be so glad to give some to a little girl who has none. Dear child, dear child, said Granny, leaning forward and stroking the soft, shining hair of the little girl. Your heart is full of love. You would be glad to bring a Christmas to every child. But their heads are so full of what they are going to get that they forget all about anybody else but themselves. Then she sighed and shook her head. Well, Granny, said Gretchen, her bright, happy tone of voice growing a little less joyous. Perhaps the dear Santa Claus will show some of the village children how to make presents that do not cost money, and some of them may surprise me Christmas morning with a present. And Granny, dear, added she, springing up from her low stool, can't I gather some of the pine branches and take them to the old sick man who lives in the house by the mill, so that he can have the sweet smell of our pine forest in his room all Christmas Day? Yes, dearie, said Granny. You may do what you can to make the Christmas bright and happy, but you must not expect any present yourself. Oh, but, Granny, said little Gretchen, her face brightening, you forget all about the shining Christmas angels who came down to earth and sang their wonderful song the night the beautiful Christ child was born. They are so loving and good that they will not forget any little child. I shall ask my dear stars tonight to tell them of us. You know, she added with a look of relief, the stars are so very high that they must know the angels quite well as they come and go with their messages from the loving God. Granny sighed as she half whispered, Poor child, poor child. But Gretchen threw her arms round Granny's neck and gave her a hearty kiss, saying as she did so, Oh, Granny, Granny, you don't talk to the stars often enough, else you wouldn't be sad at Christmas time. Then she danced all around the room, whirling her little skirts about her to show Granny how the wind had made the snow dance that day. She looked so droll and funny that Granny forgot her cares and worries and laughed with little Gretchen over her new snow dance. The days passed on, and the morning before Christmas Eve came. Gretchen, having tidied up the little room, for Granny had taught her to be a careful little housewife, was off to the forest, singing a bird-like song, almost as happy and free as the birds themselves. She was very busy that day, preparing a surprise for Granny. First, however, she gathered the most beautiful of the fir branches within her reach to take the next morning to the old sick man who lived by the mill. 
The day was all too short for the happy little girl. When Granny came trudging wearily home that night, she found the frame of the doorway covered with green pine branches. "'It's to welcome you, Granny. It's to welcome you,' cried Gretchen. "'Our old dear home wanted to give you a Christmas welcome. Don't you see? The branches of evergreen make it look as if it were smiling all over. And it is trying to say, A happy Christmas to you, Granny.' Granny laughed and kissed the little girl. As they opened the door and went in together, here was a new surprise for Granny. The four posts of the wooden bed, which stood in one corner of the room, had been trimmed by the busy little fingers, with smaller and more flexible branches of the pine trees. A small bouquet of red mountain ash berries stood at each side of the fireplace, and these, together with the trim posts of the bed, gave the plain old room quite a festival look. Gretchen laughed and clapped her hands and danced about, until the house seemed full of music to poor, tired Granny, whose heart had been sad as she turned toward their home that night, thinking of the disappointment which must come to loving little Gretchen the next morning. After supper was over, little Gretchen drew her stool up to Granny's side, and laying her soft little hands on Granny's knee, asked to be told once again the story of the coming of the Christ child. How the night that he was born the beautiful angels had sung their wonderful song, and how the whole sky had become bright with a strange and glorious light, never seen by the people of earth before. Gretchen had heard the story many, many times before, but she never grew tired of it, and now that Christmas Eve had come again, the happy little child wanted to hear it once more. When Granny had finished telling it, the two sat quiet and silent for a little while, thinking it over. Then Granny rose and said it was time for them to go to bed. She slowly took off her heavy wooden shoes, such as are worn in that country, and placed them beside the hearth. Gretchen looked thoughtfully at them for a minute or two, and then she said, Granny, don't you think that somebody in all this wide world will think of us tonight? Nay, Gretchen, said Granny, I don't think anyone will. Well then, Granny, said Gretchen, the Christmas angels will, I know, so I'm going to take one of your wooden shoes and put it on the window sill outside, so that they may see it as they pass by. I'm sure the stars will tell the Christmas angels where the shoe is. Ah, you foolish, foolish child, said Granny. You are only getting ready for a disappointment. Tomorrow morning there will be nothing whatever in the shoe. I can tell you that now. But little Gretchen would not listen. She only shook her head and cried out, Oh, Granny, you don't talk enough to the stars. With this she seized the shoe, and opening the door, hurried out to place it on the window sill. It was very dark without, and something soft and cold seemed to gently kiss her hair and face. Gretchen knew by this that it was snowing, and she looked up to the sky, anxious to see if the stars were in sight. But a strong wind was tumbling the dark, heavy snow clouds about, and had shut away all else. Never mind, said Gretchen softly to herself. The stars are up there, even if I can't see them, and the Christmas angels do not mind snowstorms. Just then a rough wind went sweeping by the little girl, whispering something to her, which she could not understand, and then it made a sudden rush up to the snow clouds, and parted them so that the deep, mysterious sky appeared beyond, and shining down out of the midst of it was Gretchen's favorite star. Ah, oh, little star, little star, said the child, laughing aloud. I knew you were there, though I couldn't see you. Will you whisper to the Christmas angels as they come by that little Gretchen wants so very much to have a Christmas gift tomorrow morning, if they have one to spare, and that she has put one of Granny's shoes upon the window sill, ready for it. A moment more, and the little girl, standing on tiptoe, had reached the window sill and placed the shoe upon it, and was back again in the house beside Granny and the warm fire. The two went quietly to bed, and that night, as little Gretchen knelt to pray to the Heavenly Father, she thanked him for having sent the Christ child into the world to teach all mankind how to be loving and unselfish, and in a few moments, she was quietly sleeping, dreaming of the Christmas angels. The next morning, very early, even before the sun was up, little Gretchen was awakened by the sound of sweet music coming from the village. She listened for a moment. 
and then she knew that the choir boys were singing the Christmas carols in the open air of the village street. She sprang up out of bed and began to dress herself as quickly as possible, singing as she dressed. While Granny was slowly putting on her clothes, little Gretchen, having finished dressing herself, unfastened the door and hurried out to see what the Christmas angels had left in the old wooden shoe. The white snow covered everything, trees, stumps, roads, and pastures, until the whole world looked like fairyland. Gretchen climbed up on a large stone which was beneath the window and carefully lifted down the wooden shoe. The snow tumbled off of it in a shower over the little girl's hands, but she did not heed that. She ran hurriedly back into the house, putting her hand into the toe of the shoe as she ran. "'Oh, Granny! Oh, Granny!' she exclaimed. "'You didn't believe the Christmas angels would think about us, but see, they have, they have. "'Here is a dear little bird nestled down in the toe of your shoe. Oh, isn't he beautiful?' Granny came forward and looked at what the child was holding lovingly in her hand. There she saw a tiny chickadee, whose wing was evidently broken by the rough and boisterous winds of the night before, and who had taken shelter in the safe, dry toe of the old wooden shoe. She gently took the little bird out of Gretchen's hands and skillfully bound his broken wing to his side, so that he need not hurt himself by trying to fly with it. Then she showed Gretchen how to make a nice warm nest for the little stranger, close beside the fire, and when their breakfast was ready she let Gretchen feed the little bird with a few moist crumbs. Later in the day Gretchen carried the fresh green boughs to the old sick man by the mill, and on her way home stopped to see and enjoy the Christmas toys of some other children whom she knew, never once wishing that they were hers. When she reached home she found that the little bird had gone to sleep. Soon, however, he opened his eyes and stretched his head up, saying just as plain as a bird could say, Now, my new friends, I want you to give me something more to eat. Gretchen gladly fed him again, and then holding him in her lap, she softly and gently stroked his gray feathers, until the little creature seemed to lose all fear of her. That evening Granny taught her a Christmas hymn, and told her another beautiful Christmas story. Then Gretchen made up a funny little story to tell to the birdie. He winked his eyes and turned his head from side to side in such a droll fashion that Gretchen laughed until the tears came. As Granny and she got ready for bed that night, Gretchen put her arms softly around Granny's neck and whispered, What a beautiful Christmas we have had today, Granny. Is there anything in the world more lovely than Christmas? Nay, child, nay, said Granny not to such loving hearts as yours. A Letter from Santa Claus for Christmas, 1849 Author Unknown My dear children, As I have always been in the habit of meeting with you on this anniversary, and as I cannot expect to see you all together this year, for the sake of old times, I am going to write you a letter. Perhaps you are not aware that I have been a silent spectator of your daily occupations, but so it is. I generally take a nap from one year to another, so after our glorious celebration at the Beehive, I packed myself away in the stovepipe for that purpose, but the hum of merry voices kept me awake, and thus I lay and listened to what was going on. The fairies, in whom you perhaps all believe, have also been quite numerous in your vicinity, and from my relationship to them I have often heard of your excursions over hill and dale, and the many gay times you have enjoyed together. I travel over many regions at this season of the year, and in order to accomplish all I wish in my endeavors to please the young folks, I shall begin my preparations a little earlier than usual, so you need not wonder if I visit some of you a little before Christmas and New Year with one of my gifts. This will consist of a few of the simplest little sketches, letters, and reminiscences of the various occurrences in which you have participated, and I hope the contents of this Christmas bow will give you as much satisfaction as those of bygone seasons, when the festive pine tree erected to my honor has been loaded with gay and glittering gifts. I trust you will all enjoy the holiday and with glad and grateful hearts fully appreciate the many privileges you enjoy as the children of kind parents, 
and the object of interest to affectionate friends. Of course, you will be most forcibly reminded of the giver of all these blessings, and you will love to listen about the gentle child Jesus, in honor of whose birth the day is celebrated. By looking back upon the past year, you can see which steps you have taken in self-improvement, what you have learned, what you've left unlearned, and the retrospect will help you to form new plans for the future, which now rises bright and beautifully before you. One little girl will have the satisfaction of having almost conquered a peevish temper, which made her very disagreeable. Another will have acquired habits of neatness and order so necessary to comfort and enjoyment. This scholar will have an increase of memory, and thus avoid the repetition of that troublesome phrase, Oh, I forgot. And that one will become more thoughtful, and will not consider the excuse, I didn't think sufficient to cover his frequent blunders. A nice, hearty little fellow that I know will have learned to read fluently and to love his books for the sake of all the good and pleasant things he can find in them, while another rogue will be kind and gentle to his sisters and give up the naughty habit of teasing his companions. The proud child will learn her true value and not think herself better than her mates, on account of her pretty face, fine clothes, or handsome residence. While best of all of these changes, the cowardly and deceitful will be ever brave and truthful, finding that honesty is the greatest safeguard, and truthfulness a shield from many temptations. All foolish quarrels will be forgotten, and the spirit of love and goodwill pervade all their actions, as the children resolve to aid their kind parents in family cares the brother and sister mutually assisting each other, and, with cheerful bright faces, make a perpetual sunshine at home. In this delightful process, the claims of those who have always served you as devoted domestics will not be forgotten, and by your thoughtfulness you can thus atone for many an unkind word or heedless exaction on your part. As children of benevolent parents, you will help to bestow gifts upon the poor and needy, and nothing, I know from watching you all, will be more pleasant than this part of the Christmas rejoicings. I shall want to hear from you in answer to this lengthy epistle, for I know you are all used to writing. And be assured I shall ever feel a sincere and hearty interest in your welfare. And whatever may be your position in life, memory will carry me back to the happy days spent in the pretty village of D. And now, as I draw on my seven-leaked boots for other scenes, I will wish you all a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Santa Claus. Lil's Travels in Santa Claus Land by Ellis Town, Sophie May, and Ella Farman Effie had been playing with her dolls one cold December morning, and Lil had been reading, until both were tired. But it stormed too hard to go out, and, as Mrs. Pellerine had said they need not do anything for two hours, their little jaws might have been dislocated by yawning before they would as much as pick up a pin. Presently Lil said, "'Effie, shall I tell you a story?' "'Oh, yes, do,' said Effie and she climbed up by Lil in the large rocking chair in front of the grate. She kept very still, for she knew Lil's stories were not to be interrupted by a sound or even a motion. The first thing Lil did was to fix her eyes on the fire, and rock backward and forward quite hard for a little while, and then she said, "'Now I am going to tell you about my thought travels.' and they are apt to be a little queerer, but, oh, ever so much nicer than the other kind. As Lil's stories usually had a formal introduction, she began, Once upon a time, when I was taking a walk through the great field beyond the orchard, I went way on, round where the path turns behind the hill. And after I had walked a little way, I came to a high wall, built right up into the sky, at first I thought I had discovered the ends of the earth, or perhaps I had somehow come to the Great Wall of China. 
but after walking a long way I came to a large gate, and over it was printed in beautiful gold letters, Santa Claus Land, and the letters were large enough for a baby to read. How large that might be, Lil did not stop to explain. But the gate was shut tight, she continued, and though I knocked and knocked and knocked as hard as I could, nobody came to open it. I was dreadfully disappointed, because I felt as if Santa Claus must live here all of the year except when he went out to pay Christmas visits, and it would be so lovely to see him in his own home, you know. But what was I to do? The gate was entirely too high to climb over, and there wasn't even a crack to peek through. Here Lil paused, and Effie drew a long breath and looked greatly disappointed. Then Lil went on. But you see, as I was poking about, I pressed a bell spring, and in a moment, jingle, 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 the bells went ringing far and near, with such a merry sound as was never heard before. While they were still ringing, the gate slowly opened, and I walked in. I didn't even stop to inquire if Santa Claus was at home, for I forgot all about myself and my manners. It was so lovely. First there was a small paved square like a court. It was surrounded by rows and rows of dark green trees, with several avenues opening between them. In the center of the court was a beautiful marble fountain, with streams of sugar plums and bonbons tumbling out of it. Funny-looking little men were filling cornucopias at the fountain, and pretty little barefoot children, with chubby hands and dimpled shoulders, took them as soon as they were filled, and ran off with them. They were all too much occupied to speak to me, but as I came up to the fountain, one of the funny little fellows gave me a cornucopia, and I marched on with the babies. We went down one of the avenues, which would have been very dark, only it was splendidly lighted up with Christmas candles. I saw the babies were slyly eating a candy or two, so I tasted mine, and they were delicious, the real Christmas kind. After we had gone a little way, the trees were smaller and not so close together, and here and there were other funny little fellows who were climbing up on ladders and tying toys and bonbons to the trees. The children stopped and delivered their packages, but I walked on, for there was something in the distance that I was curious to see. I could see that it was a large garden that looked as if it might be well cared for, and had many things growing in it. But even in the distance it didn't look natural, and when I reached it I found it was a very uncommon kind of a garden indeed. I could scarcely believe my eyes, but there were dolls and donkeys and drays and cars and croquet coming up in long straight rows, and ever so many other things beside. In one place the wooden dolls had only just started. Their funny little heads were just above ground, and I thought they looked very much surprised at their surroundings. Farther on were china dolls that looked quite grown up, and I suppose were ready to pull. And a gardener was hoeing a row of soldiers that didn't look in a very healthy condition, or as if they had done very well. The gardener looked familiar, I thought and as I approached him he stopped work, and leaning on his hoe he said, How do you do, Lillian? I am very glad to see you. The moment he raised his face I knew it was Santa Claus, for he looked exactly like the portrait we have of him. You can easily believe I was glad then. I ran and put both of my hands in his, fairly shouting that I was so glad to find him. He laughed and said, why, I am generally to be found here or hereabouts, for I work in the grounds every day. And I laughed, too, because his laugh sounded so funny, like the brook going over stones and the wind up in the trees. Two or three times, when I thought he had done, he would burst out again, laughing the vowels in this way. Ha, 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 ha! He, 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 he! Hi, 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 hi! Ho, ho! Oh! Lil did it very well, and Effie laughed till the tears came to her eyes. And she could quite believe Lil when she said, 
It grew to be so funny that I couldn't stand, but fell over into one of the little chairs that were growing in a bed just beyond the soldiers. When Santa Claus saw that, he stopped suddenly, saying, "'There, that will do. I take a hearty laugh every day for the sake of digestion.' Then he added in a whisper, "'That is the reason I live so long and don't grow old. I've been the same age ever since the chroniclers began to take notes. And those who are best able to judge think I'll continue to be this way for about one thousand eight hundred and seventy-six years longer. They probably took a new observation at the centennial, and they know exactly.' I was greatly delighted to hear this, and I told him so. He nodded and winked and said it was all right, and then asked if I'd like to see the place. I said I would, so he threw down the hoe with a sigh, saying, I don't believe I shall have more than half a crop of soldiers this season. They came up well, but the arms and legs seem to be weak. When I get to town I'll have to send out some girls with glue pots to stick them fast. The town was at some distance, and our path took us by flower beds where some exquisite little toys were growing, and a hot bed where new varieties were being pro propagated. Pretty soon we came to a plantation of young trees, with rattles and rubber balls and ivory rings growing on the branches, and as we went past they rang and bounded about in the merriest sort of a way. "'There's a nice growth,' said Santa Claus." and it was a nice growth for babies. But just beyond, I saw something so perfectly splendid that I didn't care about the plantation. Well, said Lil impressively, seeing that Effie was sufficiently expectant, it was a lovely grove. The trees were large with long, drooping branches, and the branches were just loaded with doll's clothes. There were elegant silk dresses with lovely sashes of every color. Just here Effie couldn't help saying, Oh, for she had a weakness for sashes. Lil looked stern and put a warning hand over her mouth and went on. There was everything that the most fashionable doll could want, growing in the greatest profusion. Some of the clothes had fallen, and there were funny-looking girls picking them up and packing them in trunks and boxes. "'These are all ripe,' said Santa Claus, stopping to shake a tree, and the clothes came tumbling down so fast that the workers were busier than ever. The grove was on a hill, so that we had a beautiful view of the country. First there was a park filled with reindeer, and beyond that was the town, and at one side a large farmyard filled with animals of all sorts.' But as Santa Claus seemed in a hurry, I did not stop long to look. Our path led through the park, and we stopped to call Prancer and Dancer and Donder and Blitzen, and Santa Claus fed them with lumps of sugar from his pocket. He pointed out Comet and Cupid in a distant part of the park. Dasher and Vixen were nowhere to be seen. Here I found most of the houses were Swiss cottages, but there were some fine churches and public buildings— all of beautifully illustrated building blocks, and we stopped for a moment at a long depot in which a locomotive was just smashing up. Santa Claus's house stood in the middle of the town. It was an old-fashioned looking house, very broad and low, with an enormous chimney. There was a wide step in front of the door shaded by a fig tree and grapevine and morning glories and scarlet beans clambered by the side of the latticed windows, and there were great round rose bushes with great round roses on either side of the walk leading to the door. "'Oh, it must have smelled like a party,' said Effie, and then subsided, as she remembered that she was interrupting. Inside the house was just cozy and comfortable, a real grandfatherly sort of a place." A big chair was drawn up in front of the window, and a big book was open on a table in front of the chair. A great pack half made up was on the floor, and Santa Claus stopped to add a few things from his pocket. Then he went to the kitchen and brought me a lunch of milk and strawberries and cookies, for he said I must be tired after my long walk. After I had rested a little while, 
He said if I liked I might go with him to the observatory. But just as we were starting, a funny little fellow stopped at the door with a wheelbarrow full of boxes of dishes. After Santa Claus had taken the boxes out and put them in the pack, he said slowly, Let me see. He laid his finger beside his nose as he said it, and looked at me attentively, as if I were a sum in addition, and he was adding me up. I guess I must have come out right, for he looked satisfied, and said I'd better go to the mine first, and then join him in the observatory. Now I am afraid he was not exactly polite not to go with me himself, added Lil gravely, but then he apologized by saying he had some work to do. So I followed the little fellow with the wheelbarrow, and we soon came to what looked like the entrance of a cave, but I suppose it was the mine. I followed my guide to the interior without stopping to look at the boxes and piles of dishes outside. Here I found other funny little people, busily at work with picks and shovels, taking out wooden dishes from the bottom of the cave, and china and glass from the top and sides, for the dishes hung down just like stalactites in Mammoth Cave. Here Lil opened the book she had been reading and showed Effie a picture of the stalactites. It was so curious and so pretty that I should have remained longer, said Lil. Only I remembered the observatory and Santa Claus. When I went outside, I heard his voice calling out, Lillian! Lillian! It sounded a great way off, and yet somehow it seemed to fill the air just as the wind does. I only had to look for a moment, for very nearby was a high tower. I wonder I did not see it before. But in these queer countries you are sure to see something new every time you look about. Santa Claus was standing up at a window near the top, and I ran to the entrance and commenced climbing the stairs. It was a long journey, and I was quite out of breath when I came to the end of it. But here there was such a cozy, luxurious little room, full of stuffed chairs and lounges, bird cages and flowers in the windows, and pictures on the wall. That it was delightful to rest. There was a lady sitting by a golden desk, writing in a large book, and Santa Claus was looking through a great telescope, and every once in a while he stopped and put his ear to a large speaking tube. While I was resting, he went on with his observations. Presently he said to the lady, Put down a good mark for Sarah Buttermilk. I see she is trying to conquer her quick temper. Two bad ones for Isaac Clappertongue. He'll drive his mother to the insane asylum yet. Bad ones all around for the Crossley children. They quarrel too much. A good one for Harry and Alice Pleasure. They are quick to mind. And give Ruth Olive ten, for she is a peacemaker. Just then he happened to look at me and saw I was rested, so he politely asked what I thought of the country. I said it was magnificent. He said he was sorry I didn't stop in the greenhouse, where he had wax dolls and other delicate things growing. I was very sorry about that, and then I said I thought he must be very happy to own so many delightful things. Of course I'm happy, said Santa Claus, and then he sighed. But it is an awful responsibility to reward so many children according to their deserts. For I take these observations every day, and I know who is good and who is bad. I was glad he told me about this, and now if he would only tell me what time of day he took the observations, I would have obtained really valuable information. So I stood up and made my best courtesy and said, Please, sir, would you tell me what time of day you usually look? Oh, he answered carelessly. Any time from seven in the morning till ten at night. I am not a bit particular about time. I often go without my own meals in order to make a record of table manners. For instance, last evening I saw you turn your spoon over in your mouth, and that's very unmannerly for a girl nearly fourteen. Oh, I didn't know you were looking, said I, very much ashamed, 
and I'll never do it again, I promised. Then he said I might look through the telescope, and I looked right down into our house. There was Mother very busy and very tired, and all of the children teasing. It was queer, for I was there too, and the baddest of any. Pretty soon I ran to a quiet corner with a book, and in a few minutes Mama had to leave her work and call, Lillian, Lillian, it's time for you to practice. Yes, Mama, I answered. I'll come right away. As soon as I said this, Santa Claus whistled for Comet and Cupid, and they came tearing up the tower. He put me in a tiny sleigh, and away we went, over great snow banks of clouds. And before I had time to think, I was landed in the big chair, and Mama was calling, Lillian, Lillian, it's time for you to practice, just as she is doing now, and I must go. So Lil answered, Yes, Mama, and ran to the piano. Effie sank back in the chair to think. She wished Lil had found out how many black marks she had, and whether that lady was Mrs. Santa Claus, and had, in fact, obtained more accurate information about many things. But when she asked about some of them afterwards, Lil said she didn't know, for the next time she had traveled in that direction, she found Santa Claus' land had moved. How the Secretary of the Treasury Once Played Santa Claus By Sarah L. Guerin A True Story It was a bitter cold night in November 1865. The Howard family, after the early supper, were gathered around the fire, laughing and chatting for an hour before the children, two little girls, Louise and Jean, went to bed. Mr. Howard, in the big Boston rocker, was swaying gently back and forth. There was a strained, anxious look on his pleasant face, and he answered the children's many questions in an absent-minded way, which was startling. "'Now, Papa,' said Louise, "'that's three times you have said yes, dear, when you should have said no. What is the matter?' Are you thinking? Papa is thinking very hard, dearie, said the mother. He has a hard problem to solve. Their father looked at the two eager faces for a moment and then said, Come here, chicks. I will tell you all about it. The children sprang to him and clasping them closely in his arms, he began. Let me see how wise and sensible you can be. You are both well-grown girls now. Do you think you could make a sacrifice for our sakes, Mama's and mine? Oh, yes, yes, of course we could, chorused both children. What is it? Could you two little girls give up your Christmas tree this year? Now, do you think you could? The curly heads drooped softly to the father's shoulder. He went on, It is just this way. You see, I am in the employment of the government, a servant of Uncle Sam. The war has been cruel and long. All the money has been used for the poor soldiers, so Uncle Sam hasn't paid me for some months. Nor, I heard at the office today, will he be able to do so for some time to come. Almost all my money is used up. I dare not spend a penny for anything but food and clothes for us all, dear girls. So, you see, a Christmas tree and presents are out of the question. I want you both to help us bear this, for believe me, my little lassies, it is harder for us than it will be for you. Oh, Papa, wailed Jean, we're too little to bear such dreadful things. Why... I must think I couldn't live without a Christmas tree. Why, we always have a tree. The father sighed as he kissed the tear-wet face of his darling. What has my big girl to say? He asked, looking at Louise. The brown curls were tossed back from the flushed face. Papa, don't mind Jeanie. She's too little to bear things, but I am a big girl, only... Here, a sob was choked down. You see, we're so used to it, you know. We will not talk about it any more tonight, for it is time to go to bed, said Mama. 
As the children were going slowly up the stairs, Louise heard her father say, If the Honorable Hugh McCullough could know how I suffer for my children's sake tonight, he would make an effort in my behalf. Everything went wrong at school the next day. The pretty young teacher looked at Louise in amazement, for the child's thoughts seemed to be everywhere but on her lessons. After school hours, the busy teacher looked up from her weekly reports to find Louise gazing at her intently. Well, dear, what is it? Why, Miss Annie, I did not say anything. No, dear, not with words. But you know that the eyes talk. What is the trouble? I want to ask some questions. I know the owner of the United States is Uncle Sam, but what is his last name? And who is the Honorable Hugh McCullough? And do you know where they live? <laughs> you funny child, laughed Miss Graham. I have never heard of Uncle Sam's family name, but Mr. McCullough is an intimate friend of his. In fact, he carries his purse and pays all his bills for him. And he lives in Washington. Oh, well, I'm going to write to him a big letter. Indeed. What about, dear? Can I help you in any way? You have helped me, Miss Annie. I think I can get it written all right. I... Oh, excuse me, but I can't tell you about it, because... It's something about my father's business. Miss Graham smiled again at the little one's dignity, but she drew the excited child to her loving arms and said, That's quite all right, my dear. Go to your desk and write your letter. I will give you a stamp for it. Late that afternoon, the important letter was taken to the post office. Don't you think the great man must have been amused when his secretary handed him the letter, addressed in the funny childish writing? I think the correspondence which was carried on by the distinguished man and the little girl, will tell you best how the story ended. November 30th, 1865 Dear Mr. McCullough, won't you please excuse me for writing to you? I am in such trouble, and I want you to help me, please. My papa says we can't have Christmas tree this year. Now, isn't that too awfully bad? He says Uncle Sam owes him some money and he can't get it. My papa is in the revenue business. The revenue business has stamps in it. His name is Mr. Henry Howard, 52 Sprague Street, Newark, New Jersey. Won't you please ask him to pay, else we can't have a tree. My teacher says you pay all the bills for him. Won't you ask Uncle Sam to let you pay my papa? My little sister Jeannie cries all the time. She wouldn't care much if she was dead. She feels so bad. She's so little not to have a tree. Have you got any little girls? Maybe the war wouldn't let you get paid, too. I hope your little children won't have to go without the tree. And won't you please beg Uncle Sam to pay up his bill to my papa? Please excuse bad spelling and writing. My mama always helps, but she don't know about this. Neither does my papa. Truly, your little friend, Louise Howard. P.S. Aren't you glad the war is over? December 4th, 1865. My dear little friend, I was very much pleased to receive your letter. I am glad you wrote to me in your trouble, for I can and will help you. The check for the amount the Revenue Service owes your father will be forwarded to him without fail by the 22nd of the month. So, dear child, tell him to proceed with his arrangements for the tree. It will be all right. I have a dear little girl like you. Her name is Louise, too. She was pleased with your letter and wishes she could have a picture of you and little Jeannie. Can you not send her one? Yes, my little girl will have a tree, too, so I am sure of the happiness of three children, at least. Wishing you and Jeannie a Merry Christmas. I am yours sincerely. Hugh McCullough Secretary of the Treasury. P.S. Yes, I am very glad the war is over. December 28, 1865. Dear Mr. McCullough, My papa was so surprised when I got the big letter all ceiling waxed. He laughed and kissed me hard and said, What a child! But he was glad, and so was Mama. I was so glad, and so was Jeannie. We both cried. 
We thought Mama did too. She says she didn't. Oh, what a beautiful little tree we had. Not so big or so fine as other years, but we liked it better, ever so much better than the other years, because we didn't expect it. You are such a kind gentleman. Do you see those round spots on this letter? They are kisses from Jean and me to you. This is our picture taken with our tree. Do you like it? Do you see that little man hanging right in the front? That's George Washington. It's a pen wiper. A little boy in my father's Sunday school class made it for his Christmas gift. Those are my skates hanging on the table. And that's Jeannie's doll. Isn't she nice? Jeannie has light hair and blue eyes, and I have brown hair and gray eyes. Answer soon. Your loving friend, Louise Howard. P.S. I am glad you are pleased about the war being over. But do you know, there's a dreadful lot of sick soldiers in our hospital yet. I go and sing to them every Saturday afternoon. January 15th, 1866. My dear little Louise, I was more than pleased. I was delighted with your picture. I had it on my library table on New Year's Day, and it created great interest and also admiration. The tree is beautiful, but to me, your happy little faces are more so. My little Louise clapped her hands with joy when she saw it. I enclose to you a picture of her. I knew that was George Washington before you told me. It is a striking likeness. I think that is a very nice tree for hard times. I will close with many kind wishes for the new year, indeed, for your whole future. Sincerely, your friend, Hugh McCullough. That was the end. Uh, no, not quite. I think if the great secretary could have looked into the children's room at bedtime and seen the two little white figures kneeling at their mother's knee, his heart would have glowed within him. For the ending of their prayer, said in unison, was always like this. God bless Papa and Mama and Mr. Hugh McCullough and make Louise and Jean good girls. Amen. Little Girl's Christmas by Winifred E. Lincoln It was Christmas Eve, and Little Girl had just hung up her stocking by the fireplace, right where it would be all ready for Santa when he slipped down the chimney. She knew he was coming, because, well, because it was Christmas Eve, and because he always had come to leave gifts for her on all the other Christmas Eves that she could remember and because she had seen his pictures everywhere downtown that afternoon when she was out with Mother. Still, she wasn't just satisfied. Way down in her heart she was a little uncertain, you see. When you have never really and truly seen a person with your very own eyes, it's hard to feel as if you exactly believed in them, even though that person always has left beautiful gifts for you every time he has come. Oh, he'll come, said little girl. I just know he will be here before morning, but somehow I wish... Well, what do you wish, said a tiny voice close by her, so close that little girl fairly jumped when she heard it. Why, I wish I could see Santa myself. I'd just like to go and see his house and his workshop and ride in his sleigh and know Mrs. Santa. T'would be much fun, and then I'd know for sure. "'Why don't you go, then?' said Tiny Voice. "'It's easy enough. "'Just try on these shoes and take this light in your hand, "'and you'll find your way all right.' "'So Little Girl looked down on the hearth, "'and there were two cunning little shoes side by side "'and a little spark of a light close to them, "'just as if they were all made out of one of the glowing coals of the wood fire. "'Such cunning shoes as they were, Little Girl could hardly wait "'to pull off her slippers and try them on.' They looked as if they were too small, but they weren't. They fitted exactly right, and just as Little Girl had put them both on and had taken the light in her hand, along came a little breath of wind, and away she went up the chimney along with ever so many other little sparks, 
past the soot fairies, and out into the open air, where Jack Frost and the star beams were all busy at work, making the world look pretty for Christmas. Away went little girl, two shoes, bright light and all, higher and higher, until she looked like a wee bit of a star up in the sky. It was the funniest thing, but she seemed to know the way perfectly, and didn't have to stop to make inquiries anywhere. You see, it was a straight road all the way, and when one doesn't have to think about turning to the right or the left, it makes things very much easier. Pretty soon Little Girl noticed that there was a bright light all around her. Oh, a very bright light! And right away something down in her heart began to make her feel very happy indeed. She didn't know that the Christmas spirits and little Christmas fairies were all around her, and even right inside her, because she couldn't see a single one of them, even though her eyes were very bright and could usually see a great deal. But that was just it, and little girl felt as if she wanted to laugh and sing and be glad. It made her remember the sick boy who lived next door, and she said to herself that she would carry him one of her prettiest picture books in the morning so that he could have something to make him happy all day. By and by, when the bright light all around her had grown very, very much brighter, little girl saw a path right in front of her, all straight and trim, leading up a hill to a big, big house with ever and ever so many windows in it. When she had gone just a bit nearer, she saw candles in every window, red and green and yellow ones, and every one burning brightly, so little girl knew right away that these were Christmas candles to light her on her journey and make the way dear for her, and something told her that this was Santa's house and that pretty soon she would perhaps see Santa himself. Just as she neared the steps, and before she could possibly have had time to ring the bell, the door opened, opened of itself as wide as could be, and there stood, not Santa himself, don't think it, but a funny little man with slender little legs and a roly-poly stomach which shook every now and then when he laughed. You would have known right away, just as little girl knew, that he was a very happy little man, and you would have guessed right away, too, that the reason he was so roly-poly was because he laughed and chuckled and smiled all the time for it's only sour cross folks who are thin and skimpy. Quick as a wink he pulled off his little peaked red cap, smiled the broadest kind of smile, and said, Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Come in, come in! So in went little girl, holding fast to little man's hand, and when she was really inside there was the jolliest, reddest fire all glowing and snapping, and there were little man and all his brothers and sisters who said their names were Merry Christmas and Good Cheer and ever so many other jolly-sounding things. And there was such a lot of them that little girl just knew she never could count them, no matter how long she tried. All around her were bundles and boxes and piles of toys and games, and little girl knew that these were all ready and waiting to be loaded into Santa's big sleigh, for his reindeer to whirl them away over cloud tops and snowdrifts to the little people down below who had left their stockings all ready for him. Pretty soon all the little good cheer brothers began to hurry and bustle and carry out the bundles as fast as they could to the steps where little girl could hear the jingling bells and the stamping of hooves. So little girl picked up some bundles and skipped along too, for she wanted to help a bit herself. It's no fun whatever at Christmas unless you can help, you know, and there in the yard stood the biggest sleigh that little girl had ever seen. And the reindeer were all stamping and prancing and jingling the bells on their harnesses because they were so eager to be on their way to the earth once more. She could hardly wait for Santa to come, and just as she had begun to wonder where he was, the door opened again and out came a whole forest of Christmas trees. At least it looked just as if a whole forest had started out for a walk somewhere, but a second glance showed little girl that there were thousands of Christmas sprites, and that each one carried a tree or a big Christmas wreath on his back. Behind them all she could hear someone laughing loudly and talking in a big jovial voice that sounded as if he were good friends with the whole world. And straight away she knew that Santa himself was coming. 
Little girl's heart went pit-a-pat for a minute, while she wondered if Santa would notice her. But she didn't have to wonder long, for he spied her at once, and said, "'Bless my soul, who's this? And where did you come from?' Little girl thought perhaps she might be afraid to answer him, but she wasn't one bit afraid. You see, he had such a kind little twinkle in his eyes that she felt happy right away as she replied, Oh, I'm little girl, and I wanted so much to see Santa that I just came, and here I am. Ho, 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 laughed Santa, and here you are. Wanted to see Santa, did you, and so you came. Now that's very nice, and it's too bad I'm in such a hurry, for we should like nothing better than to show you about and give you a real good time. But you see, it is quarter of twelve now, and I must be on my way at once, else I'll never reach that first chimney-top by midnight. I'd call Mrs. San and ask her to get you some supper, but she's busy finishing doll's clothes, which must be done before morning, and I guess we'd better not bother her. Is there anything that you would like, little girl? And good old Santa put his big warm hand on little girl's curls, and she felt its warmth and kindness clear down to her very heart. You see, my dears, that even though Santa was in such a great hurry, he wasn't too busy to stop and make someone happy for a minute, even if it was someone no bigger than little girl. So she smiled back into Santa's face and said, Oh, Santa, if I could only ride down to earth with you behind those splendid reindeer, I'd love to go. Won't you please take me? I'm so small that I won't take up much room on the seat, and I'll keep very still and not bother one bit. Then Santa laughed, such a laugh, big and loud and rollicking, and he said, Wants a ride, does she? Well, well, shall we take her, little elves? Shall we take her, little fairies? Shall we take her, good reindeer? And all the little elves hopped and skipped and brought little girl a sprig of holly, and all the little fairies bowed and smiled and brought her a bit of mistletoe. And all the good reindeer jingled their bells loudly, which meant, Oh, yes, let's take her. She's a good little girl. Let her ride. And before little girl could even think, she found herself all tucked up in the big fur robes beside Santa. And away they went, right out into the air over the clouds, through the Milky Way, and right under the very handle of the Big Dipper on on toward the earthland whose lights little girl began to see twinkling away down below her presently she felt the runners scrape upon something and she knew they must be on someone's roof and that santa would slip down someone's chimney in a minute how she wanted to go to you see if you had never been down a chimney and seen santa fill up the stockings you would want to go quite as much as little girl did now wouldn't you so just as little girl was wishing as hard as ever she could wish she heard a tiny voice say hold tight to his arm hold tight to his arm so she held santa's arm tight and close and he shouldered his pack never thinking that it was heavier than usual and with a bound and a slide there they were santa little girl pack and all right in the middle of a room where there was a fireplace and stockings all hung up for santa to fill just then Santa noticed little girl. He had forgotten all about her for a minute, and he was very much surprised to find that she had come too. "'Bless my soul,' he said. "'Where did you come from, little girl? And how in the world can we both get back up that chimney again? It's easy enough to slide down, but it's quite another matter to climb up again.' And Santa looked real worried. But little girl was beginning to feel very tired by this time, for she had had a very exciting evening. So she said, Oh, never mind me, Santa. I've had such a good time, and I'd just as soon stay here a while as not. I believe I'll curl up on his hearth rug a few minutes and have a little nap, for it looks as warm and cozy as our own hearth rug at home. And why, it is our own hearth rug. And it's my own nursery, for there's Teddy Bear in his chair where I leave him every night, and there's Bunny Cat curled up on his cushion in the corner. And Little Girl turned to thank Santa and say good-bye to him. But either he had gone very quickly, or else she had fallen asleep very quickly. She never could tell which, for the next thing she knew, Daddy was holding her in his arms and was saying, 
"'What is my little girl doing here? "'She must go to bed, for it's Christmas Eve, "'and old Santa won't come if he thinks there are any little folks about.' "'But little girl knew better than that, "'and when she began to tell him all about it "'and how the Christmas fairies had welcomed her "'and how Santa had given her such a fine ride, "'Daddy laughed and laughed and said, "'You've been dreaming, little girl, you've been dreaming.' "'But little girl knew better than that, too.' For there on the hearth was the little black coal which had given her two shoes and bright light, and tight in her hand she held a holly berry which one of the Christmas sprites had placed there. More than all that, there she was on the hearth rug herself, just as Santa had left her, and that was the best proof of all. The trouble was, Daddy himself had never been a little girl, so he couldn't tell anything about it. But we know she hadn't been dreaming now, don't we, my dears? If you like what you hear, please leave us a review on iTunes, like us on Facebook. You can download our app for iOS devices, Android devices, Windows phones. You can listen to Craftlet on Stitcher Radio, iHeartRadio, Google Play Music. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>